the book of Exodus, we're going to take a look at chapter 3, uh, from verse 1 through 4, verse 18 this morning. It sounds longer than it is. It's uh, shorter than some of the single chapters that we've looked at. And we're going to begin an eight-week study this morning of this particular book. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. The latter half of Genesis had to do with how Israel got into the land of Egypt. And there's two, neat pro there's two aspects to prophecy in Genesis chapter 15, and really that's a key passage for understanding parts of Genesis and parts of Exodus. In Genesis 15, it talks about how God was going to send his people into a land not their own, a foreign land, and that he was going to make them into a great nation there. And so from chapter 35 through 50 of Genesis, it's, it's the unfolding of that particular aspect of God's promise. Then the, the next part of chapter 15 has to do, and now it's little verses between verses 14 to 16, has to do with God then saying, then I'm going to take you out of that land and give you uh, the, the land that I promised. And so that's what Exodus is about. It's about the fulfillment of the second part of that prophecy. The first one, going down into Egypt. The second one, coming out and then inheriting this land that God had promised to them but there's a 400 year gap that elapses in between. The main character of the book of Exodus is Moses. I've already given you a little bit of background on his life. Uh, God's hand was on him before Moses even knew him. As I mentioned, as a baby and how he was uh, miraculously delivered. And then God's providence in getting his, the Pharaoh's daughter paying his own mother to nurse him, which is kind of cool. And then at age 40, Moses' life took an abrupt turn. Moses, like us, all of us have some character issues that need working out in our life. And Moses was, you know, the Bible talks about Moses as being one of the humblest men on the face of the earth. Uh, when God's, later on in the book of Exodus, when he's spoken of. But he might have had a little bit of a temper early on because it says in, in chapter 3, uh, he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And so it says, looking this way and that, he then kills the man and buries him in the sand. Now that's, that's not exactly patience in action at that point. Uh, the next day he saw two Israelites fighting and he says, why are you guys fighting each other? And they're like, what are you gonna do? Are you judge over us? Which is actually in, in literary, that's foreshadowing of, in fact, Moses would be their judge one day. So there's a little bit of English literature going on in there. Uh, and then they're like, are you gonna kill us too? So he realized that what he had done had been not done in secret. And so he flees for his life at age 40 to get away from Pharaoh who tries to kill him. He comes across the desert of uh, what's now Saudi Arabia and comes to a place called Midian. And then we're introduced to that there's these seven shepherdess girls that are there watering their flock and uh, they're being harassed by some men. Moses drives them away. They go home early and their dad says, hey, why are you home so early today? And they're like, oh, we got rescued by this guy. And they're like, what, you left him there? You didn't invite him back. <laughs> kind of cool. And so they bring him back and it so turns out that one of those ladies becomes Moses' wife. And so he spends the next 40 years of his life uh, looking after sheep, which is kind of, when you might think, well, that's kind of a waste of time. And yet it wasn't because God had a bigger flock for him to care for later on. And so learning how to take care of the sheep was actually preparation for Moses learning how to take care of God's people when he led them out of, out of Egypt. And we're going to pick up the account today, uh, you know, because God appears in a most incredible way uh, to Moses in a, bur in a bush that, w that was on fire and yet it wasn't consumed. And out of the bush, God identifies himself to Moses, calls him, equips him, commissions him, tells him how he's heard the cries of the Israelites and how he cares for them and he's about to deliver them. And yet not all, not all is roses because Moses didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. In fact, one of the things that uh, the culmination of Moses' excuses to God is just, could you just send somebody else? At the end of the day, that's Moses' final uh, you know, plea to God, I just don't want to go send someone else. And so, but that resonates with me and probably resonates with you is, you know, sometimes we don't want to do what God wants us to do. And we have different excuses for why I don't need to do it or why I don't want to do it. And so that's sort of the, ask, the angle I want to look at today from this, these two chapters, walking you through Moses' excuses and that with, the, with the ultimate end being that you and I would be encouraged to say yes to God where we are. Yes to obeying him, yes to following his word, yes to 
embracing Christ as Savior and Lord. Yes, to following God and whatever he asks us to do, but flipping it by considering the excuses that Moses offered up to God that day. So let's take a look at chapter 3, look at the call of Moses and his, in, in his encounter with God. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. And so Moses thought, you know what? I'm going to go over there and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? Now when the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. And so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the present home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. And so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses then said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, well, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. Say, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name, forever the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. And so go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, <coughs> Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. And so I will stretch out my hand and I will strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. I also will make the Egyptians favorably, favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles <coughs> of silver and gold and for clothing, which will, you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Moses then answered, What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord didn't appear to you. And then the Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And so the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And then the Lord said, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now that's probably the worst place to grab a snake. Ever gone snake catching? <laughs> I have. I've never tried to pick one up by its tail. Because I know he's going to swoop around and put his his little uh, teeth into my hand. And so if I'm at the cottage chasing a snake, uh, then you always go for it right behind the head. But here God says, uh, reach out your hand and take it by the, t by the tail. And so Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, the Lord said, 
is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. And so Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. And so Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they don't believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they don't believe those two signs or listen to you, then take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. To which Moses said, O oh Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm too slow of speech and tongue. To which the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak, and I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. But take the staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. And then Moses, as a little postscript, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said, let me go back to my own people in Egypt and see if any of them are still alive. To which Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. And there's another little bit of sort of uh, reverse, uh, I guess, reverse foreshadowing of some sort. Um, he's... He goes to his father-in-law says, I want to go. His father-in-law says, go. But when he goes back to Pharaoh and says, God says, let my people go, Pharaoh immediately says, says no way. And so you see the, another aspect of uh, literature in there. Well, let's walk through uh, the uh, five excuses that Moses uh, gives. And to each excuse, really, God has an answer. And you, you and I, we, we have all sorts of excuses as ourselves, so we're, which won't be covered under this, but... We're going to look at Moses's, but we have a bunch of excuses sometimes for not wanting to do what God wants us to do. And, and there's always an answer that God has for them. But Moses' first one, he says, I'm basically a nobody. Like, look at me, I'm out here in the middle of the desert, and I've been here for 40 years tending sheep. Why are you picking me to do... Wow. <laughs> Why are you picking me to do this? Um, and, and so God, what does God do to him? He says, I will be with you. You know, that's one, of the, that's one of the big things about whatever God called us to do. And, you know, it's okay to say, you know what, I, 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 uh, I don't feel like I'm up to the job. And that's, that's, that's all right to be at that point. But then once we say, I don't feel like I'm up to it, rather than saying, I'm not even going to try, what we do is, we, especially as Christians, when we think about God's calling in our life, whether it be whatever it may be, God says, you know, I'm going to go with you and I'm going to equip you, I'm going to empower you, I'm going to give you the strength that you need. And that's what God says to Moses. He says, the most important thing, Moses, is you need to know that I'm going to be there with you. You might not feel like you are up to the job or that you have the qualifications, but I will be with you and that's all that you really need. And I think about what does Jesus' name, Emmanuel, mean? It means God with us. And what, is, what was Jesus' promise to his disciples? After commissioning them, he said, you know what, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and I want you to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I what? I will be with you to the very end of the age. And so we don't go alone as believers. Uh, Christ in, indwelling us by his Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said, he says, unless I go, the, the comforter won't come. And so it says, it's better that I go. And that's how Christ is with us. And so we're not alone as his followers. There's, uh, and so what we do, we pray. We pray that we would have an abiding sense of his presence in our lives. God's always there. Sometimes God feels like he's a million miles away to us, but God is always there. And one of the great um, lessons uh, on Wednesday nights that we did from a few years ago, which I remember was John Ortberg wrote a book called God is Closer Than You Think. And sometimes in our lives, it's unmistakable. We're like, I just saw a miracle. Of course, God exists in my faith is strong. But other times, it's like in that little book, Finding Waldo, where he's a little tiny guy hidden behind an umbrella. Uh, and yet, God, he's always there. 
And that's the point, is Christ has promised to never leave us or forsake us, and you and I are to keep walking faithfully. And when God says to do something, he's not going to leave us without resource. He's going to provide all that we need. Then Moses' second excuse is, uh, why, who should I say is sending me? What if they don't recognize or accept you and your authority? It's basically his question. Uh, and then we have a most fascinating revelation of God's self. Moses is asking this question because in that day, just as it is today, Egypt was full of gods. And so when Moses goes back and says, God has sent, God's, you know, they could have pointed a thousand different gods on every corner in every temple. And so who should I say is sending me? He says, well, I want you to know that I'm the God of your father, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. But then God adds something else in chapter 3, verse 14. He says, tell them that I am is sending you. And, and it says in chapter 6, verse 3, that up to that point, God had never revealed his personal name to anyone. And look in chapter 6, verse 3. It says, I, I hadn't told you this, this, my name before. And so at this particular juncture, God reveals his personal name and says, this is, my name is I am, or, you know, it, sometimes we say Yahweh is, is uh, our way of pronouncing it. And before, people said Jehovah, and then they like, realized, you know what, we, maybe we're pronouncing it wrong. And actually, based on the, the Hebrew, it's, it's actually the proper way is Yahweh is God's personal name. God's personal name appears 6,800 times in the Old Testament. Every time you read in your English Bible, if it's got capital L-O-R-D, that's the reference to God's personal name that he revealed for the very first time to Moses at the burning bush. It's kind of an interesting name. Uh, there's an aspect of mystery to it and transcendence because it's kind of like, what do you mean I am? <laughs> His ascending, uh, that's... And so there's, a, there's that element of mystery and transcendence. And of course that makes sense because God is so much bigger than us. But there's also the aspect of God's eternality. Uh, he always, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it talks about Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, that's, that's of God, isn't it? God is the same yesterday. And there's that, that whole aspect of God not changing, being the same one. His unique position as the one true and only God, self-existent, self-sufficient, all-powerful. Uh, all of this bundled up in this name, I am. And so he says, and that's why you see reading the text, he says, tell him I am ascending you, but also add on to this, I, I'm also the God of your Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, in case they don't get it. Uh, that's, but this is my personal name that I've now revealed to you. And so it's a very special moment, which is actually kind of, it sort of it tickles my humor in a certain way. Is all these amazing revelations of God, burning bush, personal revelation of God's name, snakes, staff turned to him to snake, hand becomes leprous and not leprous, and at the end of the day, he's like, I don't want to go. <laughs> like, that's kind of funny to me, right? But how is that not untrue in our own lives as well? Uh, and so that there's always coming back to the personal side for us. Excuse number three, is uh, what if they don't believe me? Chapter four, verse one. Um, what if, what if they choose to ignore the message I bring? Uh, what if they deny that you even appeared to me? And and we ask this question: What if people don't believe me when I talk to them about Jesus, or warn them of the judgment to come, or talk, and, and encourage them to be reconciled to God? What if they say God doesn't exist? What if? What if? What if? And yet, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict people spirit who convicts people to sin and not righteousness and not the judgment to come. We are God's messengers. We are his ambassadors sent to tell people we can't save anybody. And so Moses' objection, well, what if they don't believe me? What if this? Uh, God has an answer for that. Now, the God's answer to Moses is kind of unique because God gives him three signs, three miraculous signs. One, the, the rod that turns into a snake, and when he, when he grabs it, it, it comes back to a staff. Uh, the other is the hand and the jacket from leprosy to clean again. And the last one being taking the, the clear water of the Nile and pouring it on the ground. And it, Scott says, if they don't believe you, then, then, then you, I've empowered you to perform these miraculous signs. Now you and I, uh, we, uh, we, when we think about today, God does perform miracles today. Uh, we uh, individually have I don't I've no, I've never seen anyone in our church throwing sticks on ground 
and becoming snakes. But I have seen miracles in my life, uh, and, I, and I, we've prayed for some, and we've seen them, we've heard other accounts of people. Uh, it's easy. One of the things I find as a Christian, it's very easy to forget the amazing thing that God does in our lives at times. We have, I have an incredibly short memory. That's why our faith, that's why we need to be together so regularly to encourage one another because of our shortness of memory about the awesome things that God does at times. But when we think about signs and wonders, they're not enough to save people, though, are they? God says, these will convince the elders, and I'm empowering you to do it, but when I think of, my, when I think of Christ's ministry, Jesus performed miracle after miracle. And yet, when he, when he ascended into heaven, how many followers were there? It was like 120. Uh, it wasn't until the Holy Spirit filled Peter and he preached and 3,000 people came to the Lord in one day because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so signs and wonders aren't going to save somebody. Uh, and yet, and so we rely upon the work. But in this case, here we have God saying, I'm going to equip you and empower you. I'm going to go with you. This excuse is not going to work. So the God has an answer for that one too. Excuse number four is... Uh, uh, what we identify with pretty easily, I'm not good with my words. I was like, you know what, uh, my entire life I've never been able to get a sentence out straight, so what makes you think that the Pharaoh's going to listen to me when I go to him? Um, you know, strangely, I've, I've tried to encourage some other folks, you know, I was terrified. I still don't like public speaking a lot, actually. <laughs> I, uh, I do it, and, and actually practice really helps. If whatever you're, if you're afraid of public speaking, practice, 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 but I was I would spend an entire year in anxiety as a kid, waiting for the next public speech that we had to do in, in school and class. I absolutely hated it. And yet, here I am today, strangely enough. And so, you can overcome your, your fears, is, is the point. Uh, and yet, here's Moses. He's saying, I'm not good with my words. I'm, I just can't do it. And God, God challenges and says, well, look, I'm going to give you the very words to say. And I find that encouraging, and, and that's a challenge to me, and it's a challenge to us, is before we speak, you know, sometimes you have conversations, a lot of times we just talk and we think about what we said later, but sometimes you know you have a conversation that you know is coming up, and you're preparing for it, whether it's because you need to reconcile with somebody, or you've got an important meeting at work, or wherever it is, you know there's an important conversation that's coming up, please pray about it. That's, that's critical, isn't it? You know, God provides the right words to say when we ask Him. Uh, and so when we think about Jesus' ministry on earth, His was a Spirit-led, Spirit-directed, Spirit-empowered ministry. And He, in fact, spoke also by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. Uh, and so we pray that God would direct our speech. You know, I find it pretty incredible. Sometimes uh, I try to write down some things sometimes because... You, you know that God's working. Sometimes I, I, I'm in a, con, in a situation with someone, and God will give me just the right words to say, and I know that I'm not that smart. And so, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that God is helping you at that exact moment uh, and giving you the words that you need. And, and that's not something that I would say is only unique to pastors or whatever. That's something that all of us can share together because we're all indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. But the key is, is we keeping our walk with God and praying and asking God, please direct me so that I have wisdom and that I would share your counsel with people. And, and God says, that's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. And it wasn't just for him. It's something that's also for all of us. And then the last uh, point, is, it's not even really an excuse at this point. <laughs> it's just his final word to God is, I don't want to go. Um, you know, please, and, and he's polite about it, because if you look in the text, chapter 4, verse 13, Moses said, Oh Lord, please send someone else. Uh, send, and, and that's, you know, when you and I think about, that's sometimes where we're at, where God says, you know, here's what I want you to do, and we're like, oh, I don't want to do it. And God says, well, I'm to help you. And we're like, no, oh, okay, uh, I still don't want to do it. And, then, and sometimes we're just like Moses, we're like, please send someone else. Yeah. What I found fascinating, and I, and I haven't quite worked it all, all out yet, but there's different facets, obviously, to God's anger, because here, God's, God gets angry with Moses at this point. <laughs> you know, he's just done all these awesome things, and Moses is like, uh, please just pick someone else for this job. Uh, and, and, and since God's angry, but it, I find God's anger at this point, 
It's a good lesson for us about anger. God's anger is incredibly constructive. Because if you read a little bit further into Exodus, and you see Aaron somehow is like on the way to meet Moses. And if you read later on in Exodus, it says God actually, God had, here's Moses thinking he's just taking sheep for a walk in the, in the wilderness, feeding them. But he'd already told Aaron to go out into the, into the desert to Mount Sinai to meet his brother. And so Aaron is on the way even as this whole event is unfolding. And so uh, God, who knows everything, he knows that ultimately Moses was going to come to this conclusion. And so God's already worked out the solution. And he says, you know what, I'm, your brother's on the way, and he's going to be speak for you. And then there's that neat little phrase is that you will be as God to your brother. Like, you know, my authority is on you, but Aaron will do the speaking. And, and the end result is you are still going to go and do what I tell you to do. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's what God expects of us, right? God says, you know, I want you to live a holy life. I want you to do this. I want you to forgive. I want you to, and, and, and you and I may say, well, I don't want to, or it's too costly, or whatever excuse we have for resisting the will of God, or I'm too young, or what, you know, God says, at the end of the day, I want you to do it. That's my call in your life, is here's my will, it's pretty clear, and, and I want yes from you. And, I, and, I, and by the way, I'm not going to let you go in the world without help. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to give you the words to say. Uh, you'll see some amazing things in your life by my, the working of my power. Uh, uh, but your call is, is to be faithful. And, and that's where, and we'll go to the next slide, um, uh, is all, the, what, and there's another neat principle in the scriptures. What does obedience to God always bring? It brings his blessing in our life. Uh, and we obey, we obey, we don't obey God because he's twisting our arm, but we obey God as an expression of our love to him. We think about the love of God lavished upon us, and so we want to say yes, Lord, to what he has. And that's where I want to close on our last slide, is this is a reminder, you know, is a reminder. You know, it's kind of neat. In the text, remember when God calls out from the bush, he says, Moses, Moses. And what does Moses say? Yeah. Here I am. <coughs> now he ends... Fast forward to the end. Here I am. Now send someone else. <laughs> but that's not where we're supposed to end. Rather, I take you to another guy in the Bible. What was his name? Samuel? <coughs> was it Samuel? God says, Samuel, Samuel. He says, here. no, actually, wrong guy. He says, here I am. And, and he does what God wants. But the, the, the third fellow is Isaiah. God said, he says, here I am. And he says, send me. Uh, and so there's that... that that's the rightful conclusion of it, isn't it? And, and you know, the, the fact is, is Moses' account kind of reminds me as well of Jonah. What happens if you say no? <laughs> okay. Jonah said, Jonah, God said to Jonah, this is what I got for you. And he's like, where's my ticket? <laughs> ticket out of town. And God, you know, when God tells us to do something, it's not like he says, well, okay. <laughs> I'll change my will just for you. No, he doesn't do that, does he? His, the scriptures on how to live, are, you know, it doesn't change because you turn 18 or because you turn 40 or because you turn 80. God's will is the same. And, and what is it we're supposed to say? Here I am. Send me. Yes, Lord, I will do what you call me to do. Please stand with me as we sing our closing song.